On Thursday, July the 7th, 2005, London was attacked. 56 people were killed and 700 injured. Four young men had travelled into central London and blown themselves up. All four were British citizens, outwardly respectable, yet willing to sacrifice their lives to kill and maim. But these were not Britain's first suicide bombers. In this program, we reveal a link between the mastermind of the July the 7th bombings, Muhammad Sadiq Khan, and an earlier British suicide attack. Khan knew two young Britons who had become bombers for Hamas. They had attacked an Israeli bar just two years before. It's a great honor to kill one of these people. It's a great honor. This is the story of Omar Sharif, the senior man behind that forgotten attack. It traces his life from his middle-class upbringing in Derby, through war in Afghanistan, to bomb-making hideouts in the Gaza Strip. It tells how a man from an unremarkable provincial background came to believe that in committing suicide and murder, he was doing God's work. That he would achieve martyrdom and a place in paradise. I just looked up and saw a really big golden ball, like sparkling things inside it. After the bomb went off, you can hear yourself scream. You can hear nothing. You can hear your heartbeat. I started getting really, really cold. And then I touched my leg and everything was, there was no, there was nothing there, it was a hole. Flames were all over my body and, and I started to rip my shirt off and it, it started to melt. And all the, the beard is burned up and melted on my face and blood, a lot of blood. When an Israeli bar, Mike's Place, was bombed in April 2003, it seemed like another in a stream of suicide attacks by Palestinian terrorists. But it wasn't. Within minutes of arriving, police found a Quran in English and two British passports. My first thought was that maybe the passports were fake and that it's impossible that here is a terrorist who was born in England and who's come here to carry out a terrorist attack in Israel. Till then we had never heard of anything like it. It was a shock. The passports were genuine. For the first time, two British citizens had carried out a suicide bombing. One, Asif Hanif, had died instantly in his own explosion. The second bomber, Umar Khan Sharif, had fled. Of course, we sent men to search for him. From another eyewitness we found on the street, we discovered that the person seen running south had dumped an object in a bin. This was a second bomb, Omar Sharif's. It had failed to explode. While the hunt for Omar continued in Israel, British police removed literature, documents and emails from the homes of Omar's family. Arrests followed. Suspected of knowing his plans, Omar's wife Tyra was taken to London's high security Paddington Green police station. So was his oldest brother Zahid, and his oldest sister, Pavin. The hunt for Omar Sharif ended two weeks after the bombing, when his badly decayed body was discovered floating in the sea. Rumors abounded that he had been murdered, 
perhaps by Hamas, perhaps by Israeli security. Certainly any hope that Omar Sharif would reveal the full story behind the bombing had ended. Instead, Britain launched an unprecedented trial. The emails and letters seized would become the crux of the case. Under new anti-terrorism laws, Tyra, Omar's wife, and his brother Zahid were accused of failing to alert authorities to a potential terrorist act. Allah, that the evidence I shall give shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Paveen, Omar's sister, of the more serious offence of inciting him to commit a terrorist act, a charge which carried potential life imprisonment. All three pleaded not guilty. The man at the centre of this case, Umar Sharif, hadn't always been an extremist. In 1994, the 18-year-old Omar Khan Sharif travelled down from his hometown of Derby to London. To his family's pride, he had won a place to read mathematics at King's College. Omar was the youngest of five second-generation Pakistani children. His father, Muhammad, had immigrated virtually penniless in 1962. Working 18 hours a day, he had built a chain of small businesses, and became known as the Kebab King of Derby. From an early age, Muhammad pushed his son hard. Muhammad Sharif even gave Omar a period of public school education at Repton. But Omar's family was falling apart. While he was a teenager, Omar's parents underwent a bitter divorce. Along with the other children, Omar sided with his mother. Having settled in at King's, Omar made new friends among the other British Pakistani students. Up till now, Omar had shown no serious interest in Islam. But now Omar got swept up in a religious movement that would change his life. He was approached by uh, a particular group uh, known as Hezbo Tahrir, uh, which was quite active on the university campuses in King's uh, at that time. And uh, I think Omar's very first connection with any sort of um, Islamic activity uh, was through this particular group. He started getting a lot more vocal in the second year of university. I remember Omar sort of distributing leaflets, which I never saw him do before, and hanging up posters uh, around the campus. Omar was really, really changing as a person. Among the other students who attended radical lectures at King's was 20-year-old Tyra Tabusum. Within a year, Omar announced that he was getting married to Tyra. His mother, Rashida, was stunned. She couldn't believe what young Umar was on about. She told him, that, look, I have sent you to, to the university to study, not to find a wife. Shortly after his marriage, Omar dropped out of university. He moved into the suburbs of South London to live with his in-laws. Omar took some part-time jobs, but was mostly unemployed. More significantly, he had come under the influence of one particular radical cleric. We tell them, integration, it is against God. We do not integrate with man-made laws. We are supposed to interact to change society until we see the black flag, the flag of Islam, over Downing Street. We believe on it, we walk for it, and with Allah will, and with Allah help, we will establish it, inshallah. Omar Bakri Muhammad, a Syrian refugee, had split from Hizbut Tahrir to form his own party, al Mahajirun. He continued to target young people, as did so many fundamentalist clerics. Omar Sharif was now drawn to London's most infamous mosque, Finsbury Park. Here he joined disaffected Muslims as they watched propaganda videos 
and listen to talks by Abu Hamza. For those who don't want to listen to the Islam by mouth, they will listen to it by stick. They fight in the cause of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And when you fight, you kill. You don't fight just to negotiate or to show up. Fight to kill. Until there is no enemies, until the Muslims shout, until earth become friendly with Muslims and said, oh, you Muslim, come here, come here, there's a kafir behind me, kill him. The whole earth want to fight. And when Allah allows it to talk, she'll say, oh, Muslim, there is a Jew behind me, come and kill him. It wasn't just talk. My name is uh, Abu Ibrahim. I'm uh, 21 years old. I'm a third year medical student in uh, Birmingham University. You come From the mid 90s, young British Muslims had begun to take up arms and fight in the Balkans. You see the Serbs, the same people that rape our brothers and sisters. You see their dead bodies lying around in the hundreds. You feel that you achieve something, and something is achieved here in a short amount of time. By 1998, Serbian and Albanian forces were head to head in Kosovo. And for clerics like Abu Hamza and Bakri, the war was part of a worldwide Islamic struggle. That's what the Liberation Army sends to you message. They are the army of Muslims now in Kosovo. Kosovo, Muslim land. Kosovo belong to the Muslims. They need your help. Hearing the call to arms, young British Muslims went to Albanian training camps and joined Mujahideen units. They had been widely infiltrated by Al-Qaeda. The basic combat course was three weeks. Omar Sharif also traveled to Albania for three weeks. Omar had booked a one-year flight. Why he returned early is unknown, but he seems to have taken his first active step into radical Islam. Shortly after his return to London, Omar's mother died. By now, he and Tyra had two young children, a daughter, Khadija, and a son, Hamza. Hamza is the name of Islam's first martyr. They'd left Tyra's parents and moved into their own place in Hounslow. but tensions were developing. Omar, he, he didn't want to work, so I got a contract teaching maths at a school. He's not the type to say, I don't want you to have the job, but I didn't think he was very happy. He's having to be at home with the children. Um, you know, the house is a mess and He's fed up, he's just clearly fed up. Then they asked me if I wanted to um, extend my contracts. And I remember, I remember just having like a blazing row. I said, you know, you can't stop me. Um, I want to renew my contract. And he, he just said, okay. Let's just go our separate ways. Um, and then he said, the luck, the luck, the luck. Um, under, under Islamic law, if you say it three times, then you're divorced. The police later found that the man Tyra first turned to for advice on her marriage was the head of al-Muhajirun, Omar Bakri. Whoever they received advice from, the couple stayed together. On July the 13th, 2000, Omar took his family to Damascus on a one-year visa, ostensibly for religious studies. But as well as progressing his Arabic and study of the Quran, Omar met up with friends from Hounslow. One fellow student, just 18, was destined to be his fellow bomber, Asif Hanif. Asif was sponsored by his local mosque in Hounslow. Asif formed a bond with Omar, and together they immersed themselves in religion and increasingly Islamist politics. Tyra said she knew nothing of Omar's friendship with Asif. Omar and Tyra cut short their stay in Damascus.
They returned to the UK in the summer of 2001. Signs of disaffection among young British Muslims were growing. Omar took his family to his hometown of Derby. They moved into his parents' old house, sharing with his eldest sister, Parveen. By now, Derby had also become the biggest centre for al Mahajirun outside London. Every Friday after prayers, Omar was driven home by a friend and would talk of his politics. He used to come out with new ideas and new things like saying about the McDonald's are you shouldn't eat from down there because you're sponsoring in America. And he goes, well, most of America is run by the Jew. He used to mostly talk about, uh, about Abu Hamza. He was really fond of him. He looked up to him in a kind of way. He used to go to conferences and small meetings uh, with al Mahajroon. On a number of occasions, he's told me to go down there with him as well, and uh, I've said to him, you know, no thank you. What, if anything, Omar's family knew of his connections with the likes of Omar Jroon would be crucial in their trial. I wasn't aware that he was part of any group anyway, so to me, you know, he's not part of Omar Jroon. In the months since Damascus, Omar's life had changed. He had found a new evangelical zeal, and he had come under the influence of Muhammad Siddiq Khan. In the summer of 2001, Siddiq Khan was a young teaching assistant from Leeds, yet to achieve notoriety as the leader of the July the 7th bombers, and unknown to British intelligence. Together, Omar, Asif, Siddiq Khan and others set about attempting to recruit young Muslims. One of their targets was the staff of a family firm from Manchester. I got a visit from Sadiq Khan with a couple of other people. Uh, one of them was Omar from Derby, I was introduced to him, and who we later on found was one of the bombers in Israel. So he was one of them, and we got talking and chatting to them. And on another occasion, uh, about two, four weeks later perhaps, he came back, Sadiq Khan came back, with uh, another gentleman, he introduced him as uh, Asif, Asif uh, Hanif from uh, London, who incidentally I, I'd heard of his father, I know him quite well. Sadiq Khan started inquiring about any people who were young and they wanted to learn the way of Islam. Meetings followed. Propaganda videos were central to Islamist recruitment. The videos played on a sense of victimization of the Ummah, the International Muslim Brotherhood. They also glorified the work of the martyrs dying for the Muslim cause. They were told by Sadiq that uh, in order to learn the new ways of Islam, you may be asked to go to Pakistan. And so the lad said, yeah, that'd be OK, we'll have a holiday as well. But then the names such as Afghanistan and Syria were mentioned. So at that stage, the lad said, oh, hang on a minute, this is uh, what's going on. The significance of this evidence is potentially far-reaching. It shows that Sadiq Khan's connections to Afghanistan, the base for al-Qaeda, were already established and that his radicalism had started earlier than previously known. It also shows that Omar Sharif was deeply involved in a nationwide Islamist network. One of the enduring issues for radicals like Sadiq Khan was the ultimate target for Omar's bombing, Israel. The state which declared war against Islam and the Muslim. It is a cancer in the heart of the Muslim world. It must be eradicated and removed. Oh my 
how to be a, a terrorist attack. I can't tell you anything more than that. I saw the plane hit the building. People are jumping out the windows over there. They're jumping out the windows, I guess, because they're trying to see themselves. I don't know. The horror of September the 11th was not universally shared. In Derby, Omar's sister Pavin was working as a supply teacher. Two primary schools gave accounts of her reaction to 9-11. At the first school, children complained that she'd said, the Jews were responsible for the events of September the 11th. She also said that the Americans had asked for it. At the second school, a teacher reported, she made a comment to the children that Osama bin Laden was a hero, also that September the 11th would be a day that would be celebrated and that statues would be built to Osama bin Laden. In court, where this evidence was inadmissible, Pavin gave a different account of her reaction. And everyone was like, really gobsmacked. You know, they just couldn't believe it. And I couldn't make sense of it. But to Omar, it did all make sense. Three weeks after 9-11, he booked annual leave from his call center job in Derby. On October the 22nd, he flew out to Pakistan. This was the land of his parents. His father had left here with his mother 40 years ago. Now their son was returning to their village in a valley in Kashmir. His father had chosen to be buried here. Omar stayed with a friend in the area. On the surface, all looked innocent. He began daily letters to his wife. Twenty fourth of October. I hope this letter reaches you in the best of Imam and Elf. I spoke to you yesterday, and like I said, the first few days have been great. All praise be to Allah. I'm staying at my friend's house for about a week. Then I'll go to Islamabad for a few months to study. Tyra said in court that Omar had told her he had gone to Pakistan for financial reasons. It's something to do with his father's house in um, Islamabad. Uh, something to do with inheritance, as far as I was aware. In fact, Omar was heading for Afghanistan to go to war against his own countrymen. In the wake of 9-11, the US, Britain and their allies had attacked Afghanistan. More than in any previous conflict, British Muslims were being inspired to wage jihad. Al-Qaeda and the Taliban were fighting for survival. Omar traveled under the name Abu Hamza, father of Hamza, his first son. It gave him the same name as his mentor at Finsbury Park Mosque. He went first to the Pakistan headquarters for Al a transit point for British volunteers heading into Afghanistan. He had some clothes which he gave away to some kids. He had a bag, he gave that away too, saying, pray for me that I may become a martyr in the Afghan war. He wouldn't talk much. He didn't tell us much about himself, nor would he discuss anything with us. He would just pray, recite the Holy Quran, and then go to sleep. He would remain engrossed in worship. 
He appeared to be a fighter or someone who'd already received training. I heard that he'd been fighting jihad, maybe in Bosnia or Chechnya, perhaps. Omar was now travelling with his old friend Asif Hanif. At Shabkada, a lawless border town, a truck was waiting for them. Omar and Asif travelled on into the heart of the Afghan war. They fought initially in Kabul with the foreign fighters unit of the Taliban before retreating on November the 12th. On the 30th of November, Omar wrote again. Some people think I look troubled. I try telling them that this is my normal expression. One, One brother who was speaking up to told me to, to smile. smile. He said that on this path you face all sorts of problems and you have to try to overcome them in order to pass your exam in life. I asked one teacher that and he explained to me that missing your family is natural and not from this evil self. But Allah wants you to sacrifice everything, comfort, nice food, warmth, music, TV, all the way up until the ones you love and then yourself in exchange for paradise, eternal happiness. Pray for me as I pray for you. Know that we believe in the Quran, Islam and what the beloved Prophet taught. Paradise is eternal. These actions are for the both of us. If we live a normal life, we will have to return one day. So lucky are the few who sell this life for the next. We will definitely, inshallah, meet soon. If not in this world, then in the next. Salam, Amr. The true meaning of Omar's communications home would become increasingly important in determining the guilt or innocence of his family. I think he's just trying to tell me how he is. It's just, it's just Omar talking to me in the way that he normally talks to me. You know, I'm, I'm used to him speaking to me like this. I mean, Muslims, Muslims always talk about tests and um, about life being a test and, you know, the next life. All foreign fighters were told to return home to avoid the US bombing. They would receive orders later on. When he returned, he was completely transformed. He was in a very weakened state. His complexion had become significantly tanned. His beard had grown a lot. I failed to recognize him as being the same person. He was in a very sorry state. He would engross himself in prayers and would cry loudly while he prayed. He would cry, Allah, you are annoyed with me, and that is why you have not granted me martyrdom in the war. After September the 11th, Al-Qaeda confidently targeted Europe. In 2002, Italian police tapped two North African Al-Qaeda operatives. They revealed the existence of a battalion of 25 or 26 units, suicide bombers. Our aim is to set up an Islamic army called Force 9. And in Germany, how are things there? I can't complain. We're already 10. We're also trying in Belgium, Spain, the Netherlands, Turkey, Egypt, Italy, France. But the center's still London. Don't worry about money, because Saudi Arabia's money is our money. The program has been created by someone very close to Sheikh Abdullah. And we're grateful to Sheikh Abdullah. Abu Abdullah is the nom de guerre for Osama bin Laden. There is no evidence that Omar and Asif were being referred to, but the two seem to have moved onto the fringes of the informal network, Al-Qaeda. Back in the UK, Omar was now working as a clerk in a medical center. Tyra was pregnant for the third time, and together they bought a house just down the road from Parveen. Omar remained politically active. When police raided Abu Hamza's mosque in January 2003, a letter from Omar was found. I wrote this paper about jihad. It is about jihad as part of a methodology to establish the Islamic State. 
Omar's paper called for the establishment of a worldwide Islamic state by force. Every occasion in which the Prophet and his companions fought jihad was with one objective, to make Allah's religion supreme. On this same day, March the 20th, 2003, American and British forces declared war on Iraq and Saddam Hussein. The Allies swept towards Baghdad. Militant Islamic forces, including Al-Qaeda, joined the battle. The day after war began, Omar rang Asif for a 78-second call, their first such contact that year. Omar and Asif had resolved once more to be holy warriors, Mujahideen. Together they planned to enter Iraq via Syria and Iran. Iran was an entry point for Al-Qaeda. Asif investigated flights into Iran. Omar bought a Middle Eastern guidebook marking up the section on Iran. And he rang the Iranian embassy. Omar's family insist they believed that he simply wanted to take his wife to Syria again to study. A few days before leaving, Omar met up with Zahid and wrote his will. The night before he left, Parveen and Tyra held a farewell family dinner. Tyra testified that she expected to join Omar in Syria later. As I understood, we were going for a year, you know, same as last time. I had to do the injections for the children, and as I understood, Omar had a lot to sort out when he got there, so he was going alone at first. To others, Omar had been more explicit about his plans. Last time I saw him, he was, he was talking about Iraq. He wanted to, like, fight with, with ammunition, you know, proper guns and things like that. And I said, you haven't got no trainings for that. You know, you're not even trained to do anything like that. That's when he mentioned a bit about Afghanistan. When he goes, I went to Pakistan and I went to Afghanistan. He was collected in London by Asif and they were driven to the airport. Omar Sharif and Asif Hanif were on their final mission. But even as they left England, the very nature of their mission was changing. Damascus was in ferment. Islamist forces, including Al-Qaeda and Hamas, were using the city as one of the gateways into the Iraq war. But Abu Musab al-Zakawi, the then Al-Qaeda leader, had recently halted his resistance operations until after the US invasion was complete. Omar and Asif were too late. Omar and Asif's meetings had not gone according to plan. Instead, someone gave them a new mission. They were no longer heading to Iraq, but south, towards Israel. Omar and Asif traveled first to Amman in Jordan. It's believed they were no longer working with the loose organization that is Al-Qaeda, but had been passed into the hands of Hamas. Police found phone records of a call from Omar to the family home. Parvin, another sister Nazreen, and Omar's wife Tyra were all gathered there. Omar heard my voice and then he went quiet and, and then he began to cry. And then, you know, I began to cry and I said to him, you know, what are you crying for? Um, and I don't think he said anything. 
And then I said, um, I, I don't know whether I said, please come back or, you know, why don't you come back? And he said, he said, you know, I can't come back. And and then he said, he said, yeah, yeah, it's fine, it's fine. You know, me, I'm just tired and everything. And after that, he said, um, I'll be going to university in the next few days. And then the phone cut off. The following day, Omar and Asif crossed the Allenby Bridge into the West Bank and Israel. Omar and Asif did arouse some suspicion at the border and were detained for questioning. But armed with their British passports, they were allowed to enter. Omar and Asif made their way through the West Bank to Jerusalem. On April the 15th, they finally arrived at the Eretz crossing into Gaza. Like Allenby Bridge, this was a high security checkpoint. But again, Omar and Asif's passports helped them through. Once in Gaza, Omar and Asif borrowed a mobile phone off their taxi driver. They rang the most senior Hamas commander in Gaza, Yusuf Abu Hin. It is a sign of their importance to Hamas that they were entrusted with this number. Over the next three days, their mission was confirmed. Omar and Asif were to be Hamas's first ever Western martyrs, or Shahid. Today, Hamas fighters remain proud of them. In Islam, Shahid means sacrificing oneself for one's religion, country, or honor. In Islam, the Shaheed is one who is prepared to give the self and is prepared to die for Allah so that religion, country or nation might live. Shahida are considered the most noble people on the face of the earth. Omar and Asif left Gaza. They were going back to Israel for five days to select their target. The police later recovered the map with Asif's handwritten notes marking up potential targets. They included Mike's place. Next morning, the two men checked out. Omar decided to contact his family again. Tyra didn't have an email address, and Omar directed his letter to Zahid. Salam, Zahid. I hope you're well. Please take care of yourself. Difficult times may lay ahead for you and the family in the next few weeks or months, if Allah wills. Plan now and get rid of any material you may consider problematic. I am in our quds. Please give a copy of the following message to my wife. Delete this message. Assalamu alaikum Tahira. So many amazing things have happened to me on this journey. Allah has been guiding us from place to place and has placed us in the company of his friends. After reaching our destination, Allah guided us to his friends who were very happy to see us and said they needed our help very much. I hope you're strong and know that everything is just a test and Allah will reward the patient ones. Look after Hadija, Hamza and Asia and, and bring, bring them, them up, up well. well. We did not spend a long time together in this world, but I hope through Allah's mercy and your patience, we can spend an eternity together. I was slightly confused and I understood that he was leaving me and the children and that he was trying to make me feel better that, you know, I'm leaving you now but don't worry, we'll spend an eternity together. 
I just, I just felt it was so firm and, and so final. Omar collected an email from Parveen. Parveen later testified that this was to encourage him at university. This was the last letter he received before the attack. We are happy that you are focused in your studies, inshallah. We all have to be firm and focused with reality as time is slipping away and there really is no time to be weak and emotional. Your guarantee is for the eternal ahead. There are no goodbyes, just a lapse of time. When we see you again, it will be like only half a day has passed. Stay focused and determined. You have no time for emotions. From Parveen and everyone. May Allah take care of us all and join us all soon. May Allah bless you. Thank you very much for the letter. It was very helpful. Inshallah, we will all see each other soon. Remember me in your duas. Salam, Omar. At Abu Hin's house, they were given training in the procedures for suicide bombing. They also underwent psychological preparation. Wearing a military uniform shows they're willing to obey orders. It's important to ensure that the suicide bombers are fully prepared spiritually, that they're still willing to go ahead with the operation. It's just a matter of making sure, and also to further motivate them. As is traditional for suicide bombers, Omar Sharif and Asif Hanif recorded a farewell message for the world. The real terrorists are these Israelis. They're really sickles. I saw it with my own eyes. A guy popped his head out the window and the Jew man, the dirty Jew, he raised his gun and he said, get back in your house. Imagine living like that. Somebody's got a gun like this in your face, how are you going to feel? All the time he's got this gun in your face, how are you going to feel? Muslims are being killed every day, day in, day out, every day. Be a soldier, be a civilian, we're being killed every day. It's a great honor to kill one of these people. It's a great honor. Omar preferred to make his speech in Arabic. At this time when the shouting and screaming of Muslims has become loud throughout the world, Palestine and Iraq, Afghanistan and Chechnya. At this time we say to the old world and declare it as a thunderous scream that the resolve of Muslims will not weaken. We wish to offer our lives in the way of God, to please him, to take revenge on our enemies, the Jews and the Crusaders. Ritual purification for entry into paradise requires the shaving of the underarm and pubic hair. They hid their bombs on their backs, where any bulge would go unnoticed.
Following Hamas procedure, they left the last of their cash, their passports, and a book of Quranic verses near the scene, where they could easily be found. In two man suicide attacks, the second bomber hangs back and explodes his bomb during the rescue operation. Asif was going in first. I saw somebody and something about him I didn't didn't click. Something about him was like too crazy. His body language was very agitated. And uh, I just told him like, not tonight. Go somewhere else. You're not you're not gonna drink your beer here. Basically, I lost conscience right when he exploded. Asif, just 21 years old, had become Britain's first suicide bomber. He had killed three people and injured 50. Omar didn't wait for the emergency services to arrive before trying to detonate his bomb among the survivors. The detonator exploded, but failed to set off the main charge. Omar didn't panic. Unnoticed in the chaos, he slipped away. He had failed in his suicide mission, and now his survival instincts prevailed. Omar was spotted removing his bomb, but he got away. With hundreds of police surrounding the area, Omar was trapped. He had only one direction to go, the sea, with the hope of swimming up shore a couple of kilometers. Forensic reports indicate that he drowned in the strong currents. The martyrdom Omar Sharif had sought was denied him. Thirteen months later at the Old Bailey, Omar's wife Tyra was found not guilty of failing to alert the authorities to an act of terrorism. With a hung jury, Zahid and Parveen were retried, and a year later also found not guilty. Asif's family was also investigated, and numerous phone and email exchanges were discovered. No charges were brought. For the families of those killed at Mike's place, life is still a struggle. It hurts you in the chest. You suffer from such an oppressive feeling you can't breathe. I went to sleep hugging his empty shirt. You'd wake up screaming in the night. And I felt so bad for the kids. Dad had been killed and Mum was going crazy. And what hurts me the most is that those two came from sane, normal families. They could easily be the people living next door, your neighbours. In Britain, the victims of Mike's place were far away and soon forgotten. And so too was Omar Khan Sharif, the shy student dropout. For him, the attack had been a martyrdom operation, a way into paradise according to the certainties of radical Islam. 
but Britain's first suicide bombing was also an inspiration to fellow jihadists. Perhaps this story should have sounded louder warning bells of trouble to come. Eighteen months after the attack, Omar's colleague Muhammad Sadiq Khan recorded his own farewell message to the world. By presenting ourselves for this work, we're guaranteeing ourselves paradise and gaining the good pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And by turning our backs on this work, we are guaranteeing ourselves humiliation and the anger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Jihad is an obligation on every single one of us, men and women, and by staying at home, you're turning your backs on jihad, which is a major sin, it's a kabir al guna. <clears throat> Muslims all over the world, I strongly advise you to sacrifice this life for the hereafter. Save yourselves from the fire and torment. Combat your religion and bring back your honor. <clears throat> you're not safe, not in the east or the west, and you'll never have peace until Allah's sharia reigns supreme over these lands. And I myself, I make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to raise me amongst those whom I love, like the prophets, the messengers, and the martyrs, and today's heroes like our beloved Sheikh Osama bin Laden, and all the other brothers and sisters that are fighting in Allah Ta'ala's cause. With this, I leave you to make up your own mind, and I ask you to make dua to Allah Almighty to accept the word from me and my brothers and enter us into gardens of paradise.